I want to begin uh, with sharing the passage uh, from which my sermon comes today. Uh, I, um, I chose a very familiar passage, mostly because it's about Jesus eating breakfast. John chapter 21. So let me uh, read these words. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. They went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach. But the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked. I don't know about that. I've always wondered about that little passage right there. Um, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off for the land, only about 100 yards off. And when they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And so he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell, to you, tell you, when you were younger, you used to fashion your own belts and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. And after this, he said to him, follow me. Now that passage, if you're anything like uh, me and have grown up in a church, that is a very famous passage of scripture. Um, it is usually told with a particular purpose at a particular time of the church year. It's often told right after Easter, and the point of the passage is usually some pastor getting up and telling you that this is proof of the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Now, if it's not used for that purpose, there is a second purpose it is sometimes used for in churches, and it's wrapped up in that last bit of the passage about hauling in fish and Jesus telling Peter that, you know, tend my sheep, it's, it's used to inspire missionary service. And I think that that was actually the first time I had ever heard that passage used uh, for such a purpose. It was at Urbana, which was a huge missions conference back in the 1970s and 1980s. And uh, some preacher got up and used this to get a room full of 15,000 college students to become missionaries. And so this morning, I, if, if you've heard that passage used in either of those ways, I want you to forget it. <laughs> because I really don't think that either of those two interpretations of this passage are the most helpful. So this morning, what we're going to do is we are going to wake up 
to a deep truth that is here with Jesus on the beach having breakfast, a breakfast on Caesar. And so first, the basic structure of the story is pretty simple. It has three parts. The disciples have fished all night and have caught nothing. Jesus shows up, and then they catch this really big haul of fish. And then there's the third part of the story, where Jesus invites them to sit down and have breakfast, and ends that with a conversation in Peter, with Peter. But that simple story, that three-step story, also has a really important back story. I don't know if you know this, but John chapter 21 was not the original ending of the Gospel of John. The original Gospel of John ended with chapter 20. The Gospel of John was written around 90. It's one of the last um, books written in the New Testament. And this chapter, scholars think, was written some 20 years later. So when you read the, the chapter, if you're going from 20 to 21, you think that you're just reading a sort of a continuous narrative, that the same person wrote it. But the truth is, is that later bit is an addition. It is a second ending uh, to the Gospel of John. So in this way, when I get to John chapter 21, I always think a little bit about Harry Potter. You know, you think you're at the end when they're standing on the bridge and they're looking around and the war's over and all that kind of stuff. And, and then you get 19 years later. <laughs> and that's pretty much what's happening here, is that this edition is written 19 years later. It's a second ending. And you need second endings because you have to explain something further to the audience to make them like your book. <laughs> and so that's what we have here, the backstory, John chapter 21. And it's the fact that it's a backstory that as soon as you know that, it just sort of calls forth what you must understand about these verses, is that all texts exist within context. And they exist in multiple contexts. Now I'm going to trust people here at Wild Goose. I know you, so many of you, you're good Bible readers. And you know when you go to read scripture, uh, you have two contexts. You have your own context, the, the context of the reader, what it's like while you're reading, and what's going on in the world around you. And you have the context of the actual story the occurrence of the story, the historical setting, the sociological setting, the theological setting, all of those things. But this text has one additional setting. It has us as the readers, and it has the event of Jesus and the disciples on the beach and all that is around that, but it also has the occurrence of its writing of what was going on in the year 110. And so I'm going to share with you these three contexts and use each one as a lens to go deeper into this remarkable story. The context in which we are hearing now, I don't know about you all, but I have not found the last couple years to be particularly easy. So every time I turn on the television, there's some new thing I never thought I'd see. I, I don't understand what is going on in the world around me. I feel confused. I feel at a loss. I felt like in some ways I even wrote a book about it in 2012, how the world was changing and how there was a great awakening afoot. And now somehow we've wound up here. I feel pretty horrible. And there's lots that's going on in our lives. Um, this text actually in the lectionary, for those of you who follow lectionary, came up on the Sunday after Rachel Held Evans died. And I had to preach at a church where there were a lot of people who had been her friends. And so I'm standing there in a church on this Sunday with this text, looking at people who were incredibly sad. 
And so you might bring, I don't know everything that you're bringing today to this hearing, but I want you to be aware of it, how you feel. And we're gonna come back to that at the end of my remarks. I wanna go and dive into the most sort of controversial part of this and the part you might not know very well. The context of its writing around the year 110. Now think about this. Jesus dies sometime around the year 30. The second ending of John was written 80 years later. Think back 80 years. That is a really long time. Everything that has changed in 80 years. And it was certainly that way between the events of Jesus' death and the time that this, this chapter was written. And what was really important about those 80 years is that most of them have been spent at war. Between the years 66 and 136, so going a little further than this text even goes, Rome was at war with the Jews. You got to the middle part of the first century, and Rome had just about had it. They were sick of wandering prophets challenging their authority. They were sick of these grouchy Jews out there. They were sick of people who wouldn't worship uh, Caesar. They were just really tired of it. And the Jews were tired of it too. And so Jesus was not the only potential savior who arose. There were other people who came up proclaiming that they were the Messiah or that they were going to lead a revolt against Rome. And every one of these revolts wound up in some way tragically. So what happened was Rome said, forget it. We are tired of accommodating you people. We're not going to do it anymore. You're going to get in line or we're going to kill you. That was pretty much what the Roman Empire did. And so the Roman army moves in, they destroy the temple, Jerusalem is laid waste. And what was really important about this for Christianity, of course, is that the Romans didn't know the difference between a, a Jew and a Christian. Because Christians were mostly Jews who had formed a kind of a new sect around Jesus. And so when it came to persecuting the Jews, the Romans said, okay, you're all getting persecuted. We don't care if you're a Jesus one, and we don't care if you're a Bar Kokhba one, but we're coming after you. They didn't care about your theology. All they cared about is that you were Jewish. And it was brutal, brutal for the Jews. And this event, these, 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 this war against the Jews had a psychologically profound impact on the followers of Jesus. Because the Christians, these early Jesus followers, could not believe that Jesus didn't come and rescue them. They thought that Jesus was gonna come back quickly, that they weren't going to have to face war and death they thought that when he was raised, that was it. He was going to open heaven and that that's where they were all going. But he went away. He failed to establish the sort of kingdom here on the earth that they anticipated. And not only did Jesus not come back to rescue them, but things got worse and worse and worse for his followers. So here, can you imagine yourself being one of these early Christians? You followed Jesus, you followed him to the cross, you followed him to the moment that someone encountered him on a road and said he is alive again. You have followed and you thought that everything was gonna be wrapped up. There was gonna be the hoped for conclusion of human history, triumph, but all you get is the Roman army marching in your backyard. Hopes for the kingdom, hopes for the resurrection, hopes for the return of Christ, all faded with war and death. And you can actually feel the sense of despair that begins to build in second century Christian writings. This chapter 
written in 110, is one of the earliest second century Christian writings we have. And what has been going on as these words are penned is 50 years of war. We're frustrated about 20 years of war in the Middle East. 50 years of war. Wait a second. Jesus was supposed to be the king of peace. Some peace. This is what you sent? Unexpected death, loss, war, violence, the destruction of the places that they love. There is no glow of resurrection in John chapter 21. This is a much grittier, hopeless feeling story than other resurrection accounts. And if you hear it afresh, you can actually hear the sort of anguish that is running through this text because it opens with the disciples who don't know what to do. What are we going to do with ourselves? Jesus is raised, whatever that means, but he shows up whenever he sort of pleases. You don't know when he's going to come or what he's going to do next. And so we don't know what he's, what he's up to. He's alive, but he's not alive in any way we completely recognize. He comes and goes. This is all really weird. And so what do they do? They go back and they do what they knew how to do. They go back to their old lives. Now this makes an incredible amount of sense. The people reading the story in 110 would have been tempted to do exactly the same. Hey, I became a Christian. I stopped worshiping Isis or I cut myself off from my Jewish relatives because this king of peace had come into my life and I wanted to follow Jesus. But honestly, things are just worse and where is Jesus anyway? So what the heck? I'm just going to go back and do what I know how to do. Why bother? Why bother following this guy when nothing changes, when you aren't even sure that he will show up, and when things get worse than they were before you were following him? And so they go fishing. That's what they did. That's what they knew. Their friend is dead, or maybe not. Maybe he's alive, but he's not here right now. And they kind of felt like their dreams had died with him. So they go back to the place they know, doing the thing they know. And what's really funny is that when they go back, this is why they say don't go home again, they're really bad at it. <laughs> I don't fish. My friend Brian McLaren, he fishes. He tells me things about fishing. And... Um, I did not know, but it's better to fish at night. Apparently, there are more fish out at night, and you're more likely to catch something at night. And so what it says in the text is that these disciples, they go out at night and they fish when anybody, even me, should be able to catch a fish, and they catch nothing. Their nets are empty. It's dark. It's cold. And the text says... They're stripped down to nakedness. It was actually a, a shame for a Jewish man to be naked around another Jewish man. They're in shame. This is a picture of complete despair. And I think the reason that this writer added this in 110, this, that's the way that the early second century Christian community was feeling. What happens next? And that's when we need to understand the context in which the story occurred. What was the world like it, around 30 that the story is about. Not the time it was written, but the, when the, the time the story is set. And in order to understand this, we have to understand something about fishing. So this is why I have to ask lots of questions about fishing. Um, fishing is actually a really big deal um, in the ancient Roman 
uh, world. And it was a, a very big deal for some important reasons. Um, Rome is the invisible character in this story. Rome is the inescapable setting of what is going on around 30. So this is the, when I first read this chapter for preaching that, that Sunday, uh, right after Rachel had passed away, I read it and it said, and the disciples came to the Sea of Tiberias. And I don't know why, but I stopped for a moment and I said, the Sea of Tiberias? I, I must have learned this in Sunday school, but the Sea of Tiberias, is, is that the same as the Sea of Galilee? And you look it up on Wikipedia or in your old Bible dictionary, and yes, indeed, the Sea of Galilee and the Sea of Tiberias are one and the same. Well, wait a second. How does the Sea of Galilee get to be named the Sea of Tiberias? The Sea of Tiberias, of course, is named for a Roman emperor, the Emperor Tiberius. And he was emperor from 14 to 37. Tiberius is the emperor who killed Jesus. Now, the disciples go to the sea that is named after a Roman emperor who is the Roman emperor who has just murdered their friend and their teacher. In the year 20, Herod, I preached a, synagogue, a sermon in a synagogue um, earlier this year, and I mentioned the word Herod, and I discovered something interesting. Jews hate him as much as Christians do. Um, <laughs> so in the year 20, Herod was trying to, you know, sort of brush up his status. He was trying to please Caesar. You know, so when you're trying to pre please an authoritarian ruler, what you do is you flatter them, and you do things, you build them stuff, you know, like a wall. And um, so Herod decides that he is going to build walls. He builds walls around the city of Jerusalem, but he also builds a city, and he names the city right after the emperor. He builds the city of Tiberias. Now, the city of Tiberias is three miles south of another city, Mag Magdala. And we, of course, know Magdala because of Mary Magdalene. But in the time of Jesus, Magdala was the center of a fishing industry. And what had been going on there for, for generations in Magdala was a small fishing industry that was a family-based industry where Jews lived in the town of Magdala. They would go out on their boats. They would fish. They would bring the fish in. They would sell fish at the market. And actually, Magdala was known, its nickname was the fish processing city. And so it was a town of small industry that was all owned by Jews. It was a very local concern. It was very successful. And the fish they caught were sent out all over um, Israel. Herod builds Tiberias three miles to the south. And he says, oh, Magdala, well, that's small time industry. What's really important here is that the empire has its own fishing industry. And so he built up this gigantic, beautiful port. He invited people from all over the empire, not just Jews, but a whole lot of pagans too, to come to his new city of Tiberi Tiberias and work in this amazing imperial fishing concern that would send fish not just through Israel, but all out throughout the empire. And because uh, it was an imperial concern, that meant that there were an incredible amount of taxes that were paid in order to participate in this first class international global fishing operation. As many as 40% of everything that you caught had to go, first of all, to Herod and the city of Tiberias and to Caesar himself, and then you would get some cut of whatever was left. 
This is not a free enterprise system. This is the Roman Empire coming in, building a city next door to your small town, which has been fishing for, for, for centuries with lots of nice families. And the empire builds like a giant factory fishing farm right next door to you. And not only do they tax you enormously if you're participating in this concern, but Caesar said that all of the fish in the lake, every single one of them, belong to him. So it didn't matter if you went out of the port of Tiberias. If you went out of the other port, the port that you had been going out of for a really long time, and you put a, fit, a, a boat on the water, you paid a tax to Caesar. If you caught one of Caesar's fish, you paid a tax to Caesar. If you didn't catch a fish, you still paid a tax to Caesar because you dared to put your boat on the Sea of Tiberias, and it has his name on it, and it's his sea, and those are his fish, and you have no right to any of them. They are not yours. But that's where we've always fished. The Jews were really angry at this. Many of them refused to step foot in the city of Tiberias. There was a pagan cemetery in the city, and they thought that it had desecrated the shores of the Sea of Galilee. They, 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 were, they were furious. And so the Jewish city of Magdala got poorer and poorer and poorer taxed at huge rates where people went into oppressive states of debt and could not support their families in the ways that they had been supporting their families for generations. And meanwhile, the pagans who just moved in down the street and built that big fancy city in order to, pr to, to please Caesar, they were making money hand over fist. They had better boats, bigger boats, and their boats were hauling more and more and more and more fish out of the sea. And of course, that left many fewer fish for you. When the Romans got mad at the Jews in that big war that would take place at the end of the first century, they did not destroy Tiberius. They destroyed every other city that the Jews lived in. But Tiberius, they left untouched. Because the citizens of Tiberius said, we worship Caesar. And that is the beach that Jesus shows up on at dawn. That beach, the beach that Caesar has occupied, the beach that Caesar has stolen out from underneath the Jews, the beach from which they used to launch their boats and make their living, the beach that now is claimed by Rome, even though Jesus and his disciples know that all things are God's. At the Sea of Tiberias, all things were Caesar's. Jesus shows up on the shore of a lake next to a city named for the very emp emperor who murdered him. At first, the disciples do not recognize Jesus, but they wind up catching a lot of fish. And this surprised them because they have not been getting big hauls of fish. Um, after he had told them, of course, to lower their nets. And because of this, a couple of them realize that this is Jesus. Oh my gosh, look, it's the Lord. They're thinking to themselves, you know what they're thinking to your, themselves. He's done a miracle because we don't catch fish like this anymore. And those fish are a really big de deal. I don't know how many sermons I've heard about 153 fish. Oh, it was so heavy. They pulled the nets in. That's didn't break. That's what you're going to be like when you're a missionary in Java. <laughs> Pull the fish in. It's going to be great. You're going to plant the largest church in town. Um, what's fascinating about this text is the emphasis in the text is not on 153 fish. 
The emphasis is on another word, one that you may not have noticed. 153 large fish. Now see, that kind of goes by us here in the 21st century. Oh, they caught a bunch of big fish. At the time this text was written, that is the word that would have stood out to the people who were hearing this story. Because rich people ate large fish. When the Sea of Tiberias was fished by Rome or by those small fisher, fisher family concerns, what happened was is they sort out the fish according to size. And the littler fish, those were the cheaper fish. They would get salted or they would get pickled and they would be sent to mostly poor people in the near parts of the empire to Israel. The big fish, those fish would be immediately put on ships with special kinds of holds to keep them as fresh as they could possibly be kept. And they would be sent to Rome itself. And the big fish went to the big fish in the Roman Empire. They went to the nobles. They went to the military generals. They went to the banquet halls. They went to Caesar himself. And here, this text purposefully says that Jesus, and, that Jesus' disciples that morning caught many large fish. The emphasis is on the size. In effect, not only have they fished in Caesar's lake, but they've taken his breakfast as well. And that's what Jesus is telling them. Jesus is reminding them that Caesar owns nothing. He does not own these big fish. You do not have to put those big fish on that boat going back to Rome. But in says he said, he, and he doesn't tell them to sell the fish and make a lot of money and give the money to the poor. He doesn't say that. He says, let's eat. They are in despair. They don't know what's going on. And Jesus invites them to a feast. Not just breakfast, but a feast. They eat the big fish. The fish that should be on someone else's plate. The plates of people like Herod and Pilate and Caesar. That was their breakfast. They're literally taking food from the mouth of their oppressors. And that's what we have in this text. Jesus feeds the hopeless Dis depressed, despondent, disenfranchised people of the world as if they are Caesar. Mm, 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 mm. And if you were a disciple sitting on that beach with Jesus, you would have understood all this. That Jesus was not just giving them breakfast. Jesus was not just showing up to prove that he had risen from the dead. Jesus was not calling them to be missionaries. But instead, Jesus was inviting them to an imperial feast. And this is Jesus' imperial feast, where the poor sit with their Lord, where they eat the food that is customarily served to people who are so far away from them. What we have here is Jesus' imperial feast, the eternal, ever-transgressive Thanksgiving feast of God, God's own self. This is the future. This is the kingdom. And this is what it will be like forever. And then Jesus adds one final moment to make sure that they get it. Because you see, Caesar had plenty of imperial feasts. And there was a liturgy to imperial feasts. They would eat these riches, like the gigantic fish and the other kinds of incredible game that had come from all over the empire. And at the end of the feast, Caesar, or the chief noble at the feast, would get up. And he would say to the people, I have fed you 
Do I have your loyalty? And the people who were gathered at the table would say, oh yes, Caesar, we will serve you forever. An imperial feast ended with a vow of loyalty to Caesar. Now Caesar's vow, of course, if you were there having a feast with Caesar, and Caesar turns around and says to you, um, will you be loyal to me? You're going to say, uh, yes. Because if you don't, Caesar's probably going to kill you right there at the end of the banquet. And that's uh, just the way that it worked in ancient Rome. Um, Caesar thought that you owed him everything if he gave you dinner. Uh, you owed him an infinite debt of gratitude, one that could only be repaid by giving your entire life to the empire. And now, the, the, we have a little bit of this left in contemporary culture. Uh, you might think about Hitler, uh, where at events, you know, Hitler would come into a room, people go, Heil Hitler. That's basically what they had to do here. They would have to get up and they'd have to hail Caesar. Um, and we have it in a much nicer fashion, uh, perhaps in the British Roman Empire, when after uh, a meal, there's often a toast to the queen or the king, God save the queen, and then you sing. And that's what this is, is that if the, if the king, the queen, whoever feeds you, you have to be loyal. And that's what happens here in this conversation with Jesus and Peter. Jesus feeds his friends, but interestingly enough, he doesn't ask for their loyalty. He simply asks, do you love me? Can you imagine the Emperor Tiberius turning around and saying to a group of people at a table, do you love me? That's just not even going to happen. He would say, do you obey me? Do you worship me? Will you give you your life for me. And Jesus says, do you love me? He asked the same question a second time. Do you love me? And then he asked it a third time, and the nuance is just a little different in the Greek. And it comes out, do you cherish me? And that's the difference. The imperial feast, the one that was stealing the fish from the lake, taxing the poor, renaming the sacred spaces in Israel after the name of pagan, violent emperors. The imperial feast was a feast of fear. But the Jesus feast, it might be transgressive. It might go right into Caesar's territory and take what Caesar thinks is his and simply claim it as God's abundance, but it is always a feast of love. And this brings us to now. This Thanksgiving feast that was celebrated so long ago was celebrated at the edge of the sea of despair. That's how I feel most days. I look on the news about climate change, race relations, children in cages at the border, what's being done to take rights away from people in the LGBTQ community who only had so recently gotten their rights. I look at what's going on with women and violence against others, abuse. It's the edge of the sea of despair. And not to be overly political, but I do not think that there is any coincidence. I live in Washington, D.C., and the current president, what does he do? He builds big buildings and puts his name on them and claims territory that belongs to the citizens of New York or the citizens of Washington, D.C. And every single day we have to walk past these buildings with a name on it that is telling us that we must be loyal or there will be retribution. And 
what does Jesus say? Just go eat the fish. Tiberius is not the last word. People will forget. But the Thanksgiving feast will always be set at the edge of every sea of despair. It will always be set against the lake that names itself for the emperor who is trying to set himself up as God. Even when the empire seems to have won, when death is strong, when you are at a loss as to understand any of this, Breakfast at the edge of the sea calls us. Breakfast at the edge of the sea reminds us that we are feasting like the richest people in the world. We are free from the violence that attends their power. We can set a feast without fear. And the reason we know we can do this is because it has already happened. We are not just waiting for this in some far off kingdom where Jesus will come and take us there and then we'll have it finally when we get in heaven. No, it happened. It happened on a beach 2,000 years ago. And because it already has happened, it can happen again over and over and over <laughs> That is the trajectory of God's history in the world. Keep setting that feast. And that's how we follow. We follow by setting a table, bringing out the very best food, and feeding all. Amen. Well, in Washington, London, Paris, and Managua, and any place you happen to be. Does his best to trample people down, prevent them to be what they must be. Oh, Caesar will steal, and Caesar will kill, and Caesar will do the best he can.
this day to the wondrous feast, the feast that shall never end. Welcome this day to the wondrous feast. Welcome, fishermen and friends.